Hi, this is Filiberto Amati, and we're here today for another round of our research on the future of events. I pass the mic to my Marco Bevolo, who's my co-author, and uh, he's going to introduce our esteemed guest today. Thank you, uh, Filiberto. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, uh, privileged to have here uh, a talent uh, who works uh, on talents uh, as part of our design thinker series, uh, Jeroen Frumo, uh, who is uh, uh, um, out of uh, background, uh, an engineer and an MBA uh, graduate from Tilburg University, uh, from the TIAS Business School. Um, joins us to bring the perspective uh, of uh, uh, development of talent, which is his main occupation with his own uh, uh, firm, uh, stimulation of uh, matchmaking in the labor market uh, through uh, various uh, uh, platforms, uh, the most advanced in the digital uh, context. I would like to ask uh, Jeroen, please uh, uh, tell us uh, uh, a little bit about yourself in a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Jeroen Frumo, living in the Eindhoven region, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, landed in this region after, or actually while I was studying at Eindhoven University, mechanical engineering, when I did my internship at uh, Philips in Eindhoven, and actually, um, landed there in the design department for almost 18 years. So I graduated there as a student uh, and was always involved in business management, business design, process design, process engineering, performance management, strategy, all the topics that a designer doesn't want to worry about when he is in a design firm. So besides from being a designer, I always saw myself as an active contributor in enabling design for a firm like Philips. And uh, that's also the environment where I really got infected by the design thinking virus, so to say. And that's why I also have such a passion for design professionals, not being one myself, but always having worked with them and seeing them excel in the industry and do those magical things. And not only uh, from an aesthetical and aesthetical pleasing point of view, but really bringing the design competence and design thinking on real strategic level in organizations. And that was one of the reasons also where I felt that if I also wanted to enable designers even to the next level, that I wanted to better understand what business was about and uh, how business can be thriving. And that was one of the reasons why I invested uh, in an MBA program at Tilburg University, as Marco just uh, said, somewhere halfway my career at Philips. Uh, I also uh, invested in organizational change management and business consultancy at CEO in Utrecht, which also helped me to create perspective on the process of organizational change and business transformation. So in that space, I have always been working, but with a strong passion for design and design thinking. And I made it almost my career journey to enable organizations of different styles in the design and innovation space to uh, flourish and to thrive. So uh, whether that was through my consultancy practices after my Philips tenure, after I left Philips in 2012, late 2012, started to do business consultancy combined with recruitment and uh, freelance uh, matchmaking but really with a strong ambition of having design talent, having the opportunity to start impacting industry and society at all different levels and not only in the industry where they were already recognized. So I see myself sometimes as, an, as a person that creates opportunities for others in the design space to take a next challenge, also from a career development point of view. So there needs to always be a step forward for these uh, for these professionals instead of doing the same thing twice or three times. And I do that with freelancers, I do it with job seekers, I do it with organizations, and I take the notion there of creating a win-win proposition instead of filling vacancies. Uh, therefore also taking a human-centered approach in that whole effort. So that's more or less as an introduction where I come from, what I've done. That's not describing what I'm all doing today, but we might touch upon that in a later stage. 
Filiberto and I uh, uh, discussed design a couple of years ago in terms of uh, we are the best strategic designers because we are actually not designers. And I think uh, design thinking uh, uh, does not uh, necessarily require uh, uh, industrial design as a background. Uh, it's uh, more of a mindset, a set of competences, uh, and uh, what have you. Um, and therefore, that is why you are very uh, welcome uh, in terms of uh, the Design Thinker series of our uh, uh, validation interviews because you bring uh, uh, the aspects of talent development, process management, uh, uh, business understanding to the table. And uh, your work with your own uh, firm is very much based uh, on matchmaking, uh, um, of course, uh, talent uh, selection, talent management, uh, talent coaching, and these are all things that uh, used to be uh, exclusively uh, in presence. You really accelerated uh, through the pandemic with your digital uh, practice. Um, you, one of your uh, slogans, if not uh, the, the primary slogan is, if it can be done digital, I want to have it digital. Um, where do you see in two to five, seven years from now, uh, the, the most promising platform for events uh, to take place. Uh, digital, 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 a return to uh, in presence a physical contact or uh, uh, a, a new form of hybrid and then which form of hybrid? Um, uh, sorry, we, we consider business events a conference, uh, the reunion of Philips Design that you organized through your company, um, a product launch or presentation, but also a workshop, a seminar, that can also be classified as a business event, because if there are uh, uh, 10 people in a room who are meeting, even if it's internal, then uh, it's, uh, it's a business event uh, as we experience. Uh, okay, it's, it's good that you give that notion because I, of course, I'm also very involved in uh, online collaboration, co-creativity and innovation space. And that's, let's say, a different part then of, of what you call it events. So if it's a business event to profile product, organization and talent, that's a different notion, but okay, it's good. I think anyway, um, we will never return to the traditional models that we have experienced the last 20, 30 years of business events, conference and things like that. So I think we have all witnessed that uh, some of the event types that I think we've all experienced over the last parts of our uh, careers, that they can also be enriched, enhanced with a digital dimension. And whether that is I cannot travel to New York to visit that business conference, but nowadays I can also engage in that same business conference at distance. I might have to pay the same because I'm accessing the same event with the same value add, only I'm not physically present. I'm only in the virtual space. I see that happening only more and more. So I think around business events, I think the, the notion of choice, choice for the, the consumer, so to say, of that business event, not of the the organizer, but the, the choice for the consumer becomes probably a very fundamental new reality in the near future. So where normally a business or, or an event organizer says, okay, it's a conference at this conference event center. Uh, this is the logistics around it. You sign up for uh, the opening event uh, where you can also network. And then tomorrow the real content conferences start and things that I visited those events, you probably more than I did. Uh, I don't want all of that as a choice. And I don't want to pay for all of that. And of course, I had the option to pay or not to pay for it, but it was still part of that physical experience, in-person experience. Otherwise, there was no experience. And I think the nice thing now is that over the last 18 months, definitely the last 12 months, I would say, that uh, also event organizers have discovered that where they were first in a full in-person reality and they were forced to be in a full virtual reality in the last uh, period, that there are a lot of good things of that virtual reality because you allow your conference participants 
also contributors, by the way, you allow them the choice of uh, how they want to contribute. And I think that will probably also lead towards more hybrid forms of any business conference that is, whether that is about thought leadership topics, uh, academic topics, or whether it's even a product uh, conference or um, an, 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 in, an industry conference. You saw, for instance, that um, even also in the design world, like South by Southwest had to go to an, an, uh, a virtual set. Did you hear people complain? Yes, they couldn't travel to Texas and get drunk. I'm now exaggerating a little bit, but you can also get drunk behind your own camera. Uh, so if it's about getting drunk, but it's about getting drunk together. It's about networking. It's about creating all those unique experiences that you can never have if you don't meet people in reality. Okay, that's true. You might miss that. But you could also say, this year I want to visit in person and next year maybe I do it at distance because also logistically it is more uh, appropriate. So I see only benefits of having the whole hybrid model scale up and maybe even innovate the whole conferences business so far uh, in, that, uh, in that sense. There's one other part related to that, but that's more driven by my own uh, reason why I also went virtual a lot in, in, uh, in delivering my consultancy, my coaching and my recruitment services is purely the whole planet positive drive. So around sustainability, I think it's ludicrous that for a conference, we fly hundreds of people from all kinds of sides of the world to one central destination, where we then have the taxi industry, the hotel industry, and of course, all benefit from that and the hospitality industry. And I fully understand that. But the CO2 footprint that is leaving behind, the food waste that we are uh, carrying, and the pollution, plastic pollution, other waste type of things that are occurring around all these events of bringing people together in a space, I feel that that is an uh, unresponsible type of industry behavior that now has proven itself that it can be done different. And therefore, I think it will also change for the future. That's my answer to your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have actually two follow-ups because uh, uh, one is a comment, which is uh, the, I think, sustainability uh, and in particular, uh, our uh, re-emerge and refreshed vision of what is actually achievable in terms of footprint after the COVID, because with COVID, when everything went still, we actually realized, most of us realized what was actually happening, no? So I think that would be a big driver and a big push. Yeah. On, on the digital side, I have a question because we did few interviews, and from one of those in particular emerged that, uh, um, and, and, and I reckon in my own experience with that reality, younger people experience the digital, uh, by the, well, the two-dimensional space of the screen uh, in a different way than uh, you know, older consumers like me. So for me, a screen is not going to be really immersive, OK? Uh, but for people who have been more into gaming uh, and, and into video games from an early stage, they actually have uh, an immersiveness uh, dimension which I can't grasp. And I see that when my kids, the way they relate to Minecraft uh, in three-dimensional space, uh, you know, for them it's immersive. I don't get it. I don't feel it. So, do you think that uh, is technology going to evolve uh, to, uh, let's say, make us make people like me who are older happy, or? <laughs> Are we just, they're just waiting to make us obsolent <laughs> in our obsolescence and waiting for the new generations to come? So, do you see what, in terms of technological evolution, what do you see happening in this uh, digital first uh, world? There's a few things that come to mind. One, uh, to purely look at age 
and I'm not uh, trying to discriminate here, but I'm also 50 as well. And I think Marco uh, has just turned 40. Uh, but uh, I think we, we are already the lost generation. If you talk about the topic that you just addressed, let's say by doing it a lot, you might get more affinity with it and, and sensitivity to it. And I feel that I have not only the last half year or last year, but already the last two, three years, I've invested a lot of time in trying to understand that better and how you can create engagement models that even the older generation can experience in a positive way. But I agree with you, it's more challenging. And I think it's challenging for a reason, for the simple reason that the younger generations, uh, no, I, I should say, we are all programmed by our experiences. And we, when we were programmable, these tools and these immersive digital experiences were not there yet. So that means the code in our brain is working differently than the code of our children. And that means that they can be reprogrammed very quickly because the code that they use in how to engage with information with each other and how a screen plays a role in there or not um, is totally unique and is different than how our operating system has been programmed during our formative years, I think of that. So that means we can be reprogrammed, but it takes much more effort to upgrade our operating system to a level that has the same speed and agility than the operating system of the younger generations that are upcoming. Uh, so that's, I think, a very important thing also in talent management. So mm -hmm. if you say we're looking for digital savvy type of talent in an organization. What do you actually mean by that? Someone that can sit behind Zoom and have a conference? Or is that someone that understands that there is Zoom, there's chat, there's Discord, there's content, and that, that that's creating the collaboration or the full immersive experience. And if you can almost blindly interact with that, it becomes that experience that you talked about, that you struggle with, but our children, it's natural. Uh, and it's also so natural that they're so agile that they can immediately shift to another operating system or another program that runs on their operating system, their digital savviness. And I think that's also in the event space uh, that if you are programmed like us, we said, yeah, but we want to travel to Zurich or we want to travel to Amsterdam to visit the other people because that's how our operating system is thinking. Whereas my children would say, um, can we meet on Discord? And why? Because I mean, I can also do other things tomorrow. Because they see that it is that whole hybrid reality that they are living in that creates them so much more opportunity to interact and to engage. And I think that's even more influencing also education. So the educational model, which is a business event as well, but in the educational platform where children are being trained, where professionals are preparing themselves for the future. Uh, you see it with early career starters that come with a different notion of collaboration and tool sets into an organization where they say, hey, why don't we do it like this? Or can we use that? That's not how we do it here. Organizations are already pre-programmed. So the answer to your question, I think, has to do with the operating system that's active uh, and that can be upgraded or not anymore or not quickly enough to, to follow all the different developments that are happening. And the last 18 months, in that sense, has also changed a lot on the technology side because all those tools that we still use today have evolved to the next level. And now you get the conversation, which tools are going to survive because they bring something unique as a core skill or which tools will stay also because they integrate uh, the technical capabilities and create a more immersive experience. And I think that's where you will see the differences. Yeah, thank you. So Marco, it's obsolescence for me. No, for me, it's uh, basically, I, I can visit uh, my, my, my uh, relatives uh, in Jurassic Park. It's not even obs obsolescence. Uh, you still have a notion of time. Uh, if you belong to another uh, era, you you are uh, somewhere else. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I I am so obsolete that I have another place in space. You know, it's like uh, with the quantum mechanics, the the theories. Yeah. Well, um, you made a very clear statement about conferences uh, going hybrid or digital, and 
I think uh, preferably digital in, in, in a way uh, from generational point of view because uh, the generational driver is pushing everything into digital if I understood you correctly. Um, looking at uh, the other uh, three drivers we have, uh, learning and mentoring, coaching, caring, networking and matchmaking for business purposes that used to be I go to a conference, I come home with a stack of business cards and somebody else will sell uh, services and products or the actual transaction. Where do you see the best opportunities to make the future of events? Uh, where do you see uh, the, 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 the more, I would say the most urgent need to redefine things and the most uh, uh, pressing priority uh, to for uh, for corporates or uh, businesses to invest. I think in in general, if you talk about matchmaking and whether that's company to company or person to person, uh, I truly believe it's all about human relationship. Okay, because a business is a is a consortium of human relationships that wants to work with another business, which is a consortium of relationships. And you might have a product that you want to sell, but whether you want to make the, the decision, I want to buy this product from this company, is not only related to the spec sheet yeah. that you find on a webinar or on, an, on a website. And definitely, if you do that through uh, the conferences, uh, the business conferences, where you present your product or your technology in your company, it's people presenting. You take home business cards. That's that's, that's only a representation of an individual that you've met and not cards that you grab from a desk somewhere and yeah. say, I'm going to call this person later. You will never call that person if you've not met the person. So I, I think that in, in the, the matchmaking, in the business matchmaking space, and whether that is talent acquisition or whether that is business acquisition or product acquisition, you can call that all forms of matchmaking. I think if we want to make the difference in the future and want to sustain it, Whatever technology we're going to use, whatever event we're going to attend, I think it needs to even focus more on true immersive human-to-human -human experiences and building connections. Because the data about products, the data about companies, you can find everywhere. Yeah. But you cannot engineer digitally the relationship with another human being. So I think in, in the conference space and then also in the hybrid or in the full virtual version and i think it's more it will be for reality in the future by the way i don't believe only in virtual uh, but uh, i think in the end it is about um, empowering individuals to connect with others and transact from there yeah okay filiberto no follow up thank you um do you see uh, do you see any new role for you in this world you describe i mean uh, to be honest it's it's uh, i it's it's uh, less digital than i expected i expected you to be even more extremist <laughs> but uh, no 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 i i don't think in in the extremes i think in the, in the options and using the options and although my option will be digital first as I would say, uh, for the reasons I mentioned already earlier in this conversation, doesn't mean I'm ignoring the, the, the human to human interaction. I also just came back from a human to human project team meeting to scope a project for a possible client that we want to serve together. And we felt we couldn't do that over Zoom anymore. We wanted to see each other. But we started to develop the relationships in the virtual space. So you can even start building teams. Uh, you, in a virtual reality, uh, to be very honest, I'm working with a business partner together who lives in Germany, and you guys also live at distance from each other. But we have met each other in real life during the last 24 months, twice for two hours. We, I think uh, we have met the last time in uh, Rimini in 2019. Yeah, so what I'm saying is you can be, and we actually started the relationship all virtual. I work in a non-profit organization together with four other people. And we have never met face to face. I mean, in person, but we see 
every week for an hour and a half and we share all the ins and outs and the emotions i, I have uh, clients and uh, people who work for me in projects that i never met physically never no, no, but I, think, I know them for 15 years by the way yeah <laughs> but I think this is a that's why i'm saying this is not COVID only this is not post-pandemic realities this was always there it is a conscious choice to say what is collaboration for me? And I think that is utilizing each other's strengths and qualities in order to create value. And for me, that doesn't need to happen in the same space. I don't believe in office-based working only. I might not even, I, I was just having a conversation with someone else and we thought we should, we should skip the whole taxonomy of working from the office or working from home. It is about the working location. Mm. It is, what is your working location? Oh, today it's here. Tomorrow it's there. Today it's alone. Tomorrow it's together. Today it's together, but in a different medium. I'd say it's all about creating value together and you and that the working location is then something else in the physical space where yeah. you do that. And I think that is in many things uh, the case as well. Coming back to your question, um, what I think is essential in, in that whole process is that we keep engineering the valuable relationships between human beings. And I think then we can be really impactful. And uh, I don't need to be extremist in that to say that that needs to be in-person or, or digital. No, 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 it's clear. You need to use both. Yeah. Filiberto, would you like to, do you, do you have any reflection? No, I don't have any follow-up. I think I, we perfectly agree. And then, as I said, you know, I'm, we are living examples of the reality you describe. And uh, while, you know, probably we were early adopters uh, of this reality, which got completely accelerated during COVID because of the lockdowns. And I think uh, that is true that sometimes, you know, uh, one example, Mark and I try to schedule and be as efficient as possible, but you need to have interactions, for example, which are just random, you know, which are just, they're sometimes over WhatsApp, right? so it's not that they are completely technological free, but that's how we also build a relationship in, you know, trying to get to know each other in a more, uh, you know, uh, a random uh, dimension, random way, rather than focusing on efficiency and, and everything. Uh, Iron, that was really great. I wanted to thank you very much for your time. It was a real pleasure. Uh, and uh, uh, Marco? Well, uh, last comment. From design thinker to thought leader, uh, the step uh, is not uh, uh, automatic, but I think uh, you definitely uh, hit. Uh, the mark uh, and you gave a great contribution thank you very much you're welcome we will definitely see each other again uh, we 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 live at the two opposite extremes uh, of the town so we will meet in the center i hope uh, very yeah. soon let's thank do that so yeah. good, good luck with uh, the program good luck with all the research and uh, let me know when i can contribute again perfect yes. thank you very thank much you. thank you bye-bye